everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I am here with my friend and colleague, another Dr. Jill Schofield today, and we're actually neighbors. We're both practicing in Colorado, and we were just saying when we got on um, how it's been so neat because we share a lot of the same patients, and we've, I know I've heard great things about her, and uh, so we shared a lot of the same paths as far as the kind of complex chronic illness that we both see. Today, we are going to dive into specifics on breast implant illness. I know a lot of my women listeners and maybe men who have a spouse or partner, um, anyone out there, this has been a big hot topic, and we're going to dive into some of the discussion on the details around that. But before I do, I want to introduce my guest. Um, Dr. Schofield is the founder and director of the Center for Multisystem Disease. She graduated from the University of Colorado School of Medicine with honors in 1995 and completed her internship and residency in internal medicine at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore from 95 to 98. She worked for many years as a hospitalist and teaching attending at St. Joseph Hospital in Denver before developing an interest in autoimmune disease. She's published a number of original research papers and regularly presents her work at national and international meetings. She's associate clinical professor at the University of Colorado in the Department of Medicine. She was a recipient of the Dysautonomia Support Network Patients' Choice Game Changer Award. I can totally see how that would go. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, for her work in the um, use of immunoglobulin therapy and autoimmune dysautonomia. Her primary areas of interest are the antiphospholipid syndrome and the emerging fields of autoimmune dysautonomia and mast cell activation syndrome. Um, that's what's really special about our talk today because whether you know it or not, our topic on breast implant illness is kind of going to dovetail. So first of all, just welcome and thank you so much for taking the time today, Dr. Jill. <laughs> yes, thanks so much for having me. And uh, I have like mutual respect for you as well. Um, so I appreciate the compliments, but uh, I look forward to, to uh, sharing this conversation today about this, what I think is a really important topic. Yeah, me too. I am absolutely delighted to have you here because it's such a relevant thing. Before we dive into that topic, I know I always love to know, we heard a little bit about your background. You actually trained here in Colorado. I went to Johns Hopkins, um, but how did you get first interested in medicine? What was your path to medicine? And oh, then in medicine, when I was four, my cousin who was six said she wanted to be a nurse. And I said, I want to be a doctor. And she became a nurse and she's an ICU nurse today. And I became a doctor. So I never really wavered from that. I loved watching doctor shows from a young age and um, just sort of went straight yeah. through the path. That's amazing. So uh, you were six and she was four or was opposite? You well, were I was four and she was four. six. Oh my yeah, I was very young when I knew that. That is amazing. And you know, what's even more amazing is you've chosen, like I have a very complex, like if any, if any um, area of medicine is so is complex and, and difficult, we're in it. Right. <laughs> and it's yeah. interesting. it takes a special person. Is there anything about like, how did you go from internal medicine? You clearly had some experiences that kind of led you down the dysautonomia antiphospholipid. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Well, I was going to do oncology and then I quickly, uh, I was in a fellowship for that. And I quickly realized that was not the field for me. I didn't like telling people they were going to die. It felt like cookbook medicine. The diagnosis was already made and it just felt really boring to me and also stressful trying to deliver the message, a negative message to people. So I took a, what was going to be a temporary job as a hospitalist and I loved it. And um, I did that while my kids were growing up. I was able to work part-time. It was perfect. And then um, at some point I ran into a couple of patients in a row with antiphospholipid syndrome and um, kind of started to learn a lot about that through these few patients, one of whom was a nurse. Mm -hmm. And um, two of them had POTS. And, and that's when I re reached out to Dr. Hughes, who um, is the guy who first described the, the British rheumatologist who first described um, antiphospholipid syndrome or Hughes syndrome, and we described the link with POTS. And so then I went to the university and did two years of multidisciplinary training in autoimmune disease. Um, and while I was there, I started a POTS clinic. And um, these patients, as you know, are very complex. And so once you start doing POTS and autoimmunity, you quickly start to learn about mast cell activation, although it wasn't so quickly because it was a very new and emerging yes. area. Um, I went to work with Dr. Afrin when he was yes. at the University of Minnesota. I went to work with Dr. Goodman, Brent Goodman at Mayo Scottsdale, who's uh, got a practice very similar to mine and is an um, autonomic specialist. And um, 
I also went to a lot of international meetings and um, that was when I first learned about uh, breast implant illness from Dr. Yehuda Schoenfeld, who's the guy who described Asia or autoimmune autoinflammatory syndromes induced by adjuvants of which breast implant illness is probably the most common um, type of Asia. Um, and so my eyes were always open to that because I, I went to that lecture kind of very early in that two year training period that I did. And um, basically those patients develop what we, we now know as long COVID. It, it's very much the same illness. It's just a different trigger. And so you and I and other people who were doing this work before COVID, we were seeing all the same patients, but um, I, I now ask everybody who walks through my door if they have breast implants or have ever had breast, breast implants or also facial fillers, which are less known um, to cause the same thing. Um, and I've seen a few cases of that, of the, like Juvederm and Restylane and those setting off um, auto, autoimmune and autoinflammatory disease. And I, I think I also first learned about that from Dr. Yehuda Schoenfeld as well, uh, that, that that can be serve as an immune adjuvant as well. So just for those uh, patients or, or, or general public listening, let's frame this because I love where you're going and you and I are totally following because we know how these things from our environment can impact our immune system. Let's go back to just antiphospholipid syndrome, your doorway into this and describe kind of in general, what is that? What might patients notice first and what will be the markers in the blood for that? And then we'll dive deeper into the triggers and the breast implant. Yeah, and that, that is one of the autoimmune conditions or at least the autoantibodies that can be produced or found in patients with breast implant illness. And um, it's not really called antiphospholipid syndrome unless you've had a blood clot so or severe pregnancy morbidity, but it's basically a systemic autoimmune disease, kind of a cousin of lupus. In fact, about a fifth of patients with lupus have antiphospholipid syndrome and the, and the syndrome was first described in patients with lupus and it was later found that it's actually more common, occurs more commonly without lupus, it's the so-called primary antiphospholipid syndrome. And the hallmarks of antiphospholipid syndrome, as I already alluded to, are blood clots, both in the arteries and in the veins. Really, clotting can occur anywhere, and it's a very potent clotting disorder. Um, it can be a very potent clotting disorder. And then serious pregnancy complications like stillbirth, late miscarriage, preeclampsia, eclampsia, intrauterine growth restriction. Um, and But... The patients that have POTS, um, they don't most often, well, I guess many of them actually do meet the criteria. The, the criteria in many of the autoimmune diseases, as you know, are like capturing the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. But we, you know, there is actually a code for antiphospholipid antibody positivity. So I, I tend to be yeah. follow that kind of strictly. I go off the criteria. And so most people actually don't meet the criteria for the syndrome, but um, so you could have the antiphospholipid antibodies and not the syndrome because you haven't had a clot and not truly lupus yeah. you have skin manifestations. And, yeah, and they don't have, they usually don't. My patients yeah. with POTS don't usually have lupus. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. And I would say, I agree. I see more the, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, say, say I would that see much more of the antiphospholipid antibodies without the whole sequela. Exactly. Right. And it's important to catch them before. I, I find if yeah. you know somebody has it and you know you can often prevent them from having a clot it's the people who don't know they have the antibodies that are kind of a walk yes. in time yes and i love that you mentioned long covid because we're seeing what we've already seen for years it's just there's so many more people that are affected that um there's more people who yeah. have these kinds of syndromes as that virus was a trigger just like all these others oh, it was a major it's just majorly blows up mast cells yeah. Yeah. And occasionally autoimmunity, but more, I think, mast cells. Mm -hmm. So uh, also just for clarity, are you talking like anti-cardiolipin and antiphospholipid or what actual test? Anticardiolipin, well, there's three criteria tests. One is the lupus anticoagulant, which is um, actually not an antibody test, but a clotting test. And then there's anti-cardiolipin antibodies, beta-2 glycoprotein at one antibodies. And then there's a couple non-criteria antibodies. And I always test for the non-criteria antibodies too, because some patients only have the non-criteria antibodies and sometimes they have two or three of them. And, and I know that they're playing a role in their illness because they have 
features of the illness, including things like libido reticularis, which is a lacy pattern on the skin that's kind of a um, seen in a, a significant subset of APS patients. Uh, they have Raynaud's, they have refractory migraine, they have cognitive dysfunction, they have white matter change, they have valvular thickening, there's various, they have low platelet count, there's various kind of features of antiphospholipid syndrome that aren't even included at all in the criteria. Yes, um, in and, and POTS, you know, it, it, it isn't if I go to the international APS meetings and, and it's not even discussed, mm-hmm. you know, it's not even on the radar. Um, but, and, and I'm sure if you go to the Sjogren's meetings, POTS yeah. isn't even on the radar either. Yes. And there's a strong link there. I think it's just that, you know, the rheumatologists, they're not, in, they have no training in POTS or not interested in adding that to their skill set because they have too, there's too many patients who fit into the boxes that meet the criteria for the FDA approved biologics of right. the treat that doesn't make sense for them to add that on. Um, but it just sort of has left a lot of people falling through the cracks who have these conditions. Because yeah. I know that I know that um, <laughs> that these autoimmune conditions play are causative of POTS because if you treat them with IVIG, they get better. Mm-hmm. The ones who have those antibodies persistently present and features of that auto those autoimmune conditions. So um, but you know, everything's slow. We all know it's evidence is slow in medicine, especially in areas where the mainstream have no interest. Mm, I love that you say that. Cause again, we're all, I use meds just like you do, and they're very appropriate, but some of these big blockbuster biologics, they have all the money behind them. So of course that's the direction that medicine gets taught. If you have a TNF mm-hmm. alpha blocker, well, let's use this and let's use the diagnoses. And then the rest of the stuff, like you said, falls to the, cl- the cracks because sometimes it's as much as simple as electrolytes or beta blockers or some of these things that are generic or inexpensive mm-hmm. or so, um, right. so you're saying that there's just a lot of people in this big bucket of antiphospholipid antibodies and, and likeness, then the smaller bucket is the antiphospholipid syndrome, which includes the clots and somewhere in there also the lupus, but we're seeing these larger groups of people with autoimmunity. Um, and then let's link it to, we talked about breast implant illness and all these outside things. Can you take us through how would something like an implant or fillers actually trigger the immune system to attack itself, like to make that connection for us, for our listeners. Yeah, so there, silicone is considered an immune adjuvant. So an adjuvant is um, a chemical that attaches to an antigen, so a piece of an infectious agent or whatnot, that makes the immune system recognize it. So if you get a vaccine and they, they take a piece of a virus, and they just put the piece of the virus in your body, nothing will happen. The adjuvant attaches to that piece of the virus and and attracts the immune system. So it's kind of a nonspecific stimulator of the immune system. And for most people, it's okay. But for people, everything exists on a bell-shaped curve, including how active your immune system is. If you're over here and your immune system is more active, um, you may be tipped over into developing Asia, autoimmune, autoinflammatory syndromes induced by adjuvants. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, in, in historical times before we had vaccines, which, by the way, all have an adjuvant, except I believe the pneumococcal vaccine, um, the people who had the less active immune system, they all died of infections. You know, yeah. if you go, if you right. go to the Fairmount Cemetery in Denver, you know, you see all these these tombstones of one-year-olds, two-year-olds, six men, they were all dying of infections. And so now it's these people's turn, you know, that are getting tipped over by, um, by adjuvants. Um, and silicone uh, was, uh, is recognized to be an adjuvant now, but it's very interesting if you go through the um, literature about breast implant illness, because up until it was published by the Netherlands in JAMA Oncology in 2018, 2018, I believe, um, 43 cases of um, anaplastic large cell lymphoma of the breast. And they found an odds ratio of 421 that somebody who had that had breast implants. 
Wow. So that provided this overwhelming evidence that the immune system was in some way being stimulated by the breast implants because the lymphoma is a tumor of the lymphocytes, which are part of the immune system. And they're actually the cells that make the autoantibodies. And before that, every there's publication after publication after publication, New England Journal of Medicine, FDA, everybody saying, breast implant, there's no such thing as breast implant illness. Nobody, you know, and it's right after that paper, everything just switched, just like a light switch went off. Wow. And now oh, all these papers coming out. Oh yeah, this is, they're associated with this, 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 and this. And I think in the early days to the, in the defense of the people who did the early work, um, part of the problem with breast implant illness is, is women develop, there's several problems with, with it in terms of trying to, um, characterize it as a real disease entity. One is that it, it develops gradually. The latency, right? It yes. can occur from very quickly after the implants to as late as 50 years. Mm -hmm. And that same time span was also seen in the women who developed anaplastic large cell lymphoma, so one to 40 years, I think. Um, and so if, if, if you get sick 20 years later, how do you know it was the breast implants and not, so you don't. Um, um, and also there, the women were not actually meeting criteria for things like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. And instead they were having, they probably, a lot of people have POTS. A lot of people have mast cell activation syndrome, neither of which was described until, right. or really wreck. I should say they were, might've been MCAS was the first case report 2007 POTS mm -hmm. was described in 1983, but like it wasn't recognized broadly by anybody until just the last few years, literally, right. you know, and so, and both of those conditions can be extremely disabling in and of themselves. Yes. yes. And so people were just having fatigue, rashes, dry eye, hair loss, post-exertional malaise, tachycardia, you know, all these things, but they didn't have a diagnosis. Yeah. So they said they don't have anything. Right. just hysterical women. Yeah. yeah. And when um, two things happened, the first was when the Netherlands published this very well done study from their lab, national pathology database, um, showing the link with anaplastic large cell lymphoma. And then women started connecting on social media mm -hmm. and they were like, I got mine out and I feel better. I got mine out and I feel better. I got mine out. And so people started saying, I want mine out. Yes. And then doctors, some doctors actually listen to the women. And so now, you know, that coupled with that, that publication really changed everything. Yeah. And the greatest thing of all, I don't know if you're aware, you know, in October of 2021, the FDA um, restricted the sale of breast implants to surgeons who agreed that they would personally go through a seven page checklist of all the risks mm. of breast implants with the patient. And it could not be delegated to a nurse or an aide yeah. or anybody else it has to be the doctor to the patient. And everything has to be initial patient has to be given a copy of it. And so now the breast implant business is just going to go boom like that, because there was actually a study asking the public, if you, before they knew this checklist, would you consider getting breast implants? And 65% of women were like, yeah, yeah, let's, let's, that might be good, you know? Yeah. And then when they saw this checklist, it, it went way down to, I don't know what the number was, like 15 yeah. or 20%. So there's still people who will do it, mm -hmm. um, but at least they will know if they start to get sick that they better get the implants out. Yeah. So that was the just- informed consent, how it should have been. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith, is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme, or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you wanna get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience.
Yeah, like I mean, because surgeons, you can't really expect them to know about the risk, but I mean, kind of you should, you know. Right. I don't know. I have a little bit of mixed feelings about that, but um now they know. Mm, yeah, because now you and I see all the sequelae. So what so um we see the people who had the implants 20 years ago, you know, and actually most of the people who I see, they already had theirs out. Mm -hmm. They figured out on their own, they already had theirs out. Um, and the longer you go between the time you had them in and the time you get them out, the less likely you benefit or the let to the mm -hmm. lesser degree you benefit yeah. from getting them out. And that, that's part of the tricky, the tricky part is you can't guarantee somebody that they get them out. They're going to, they're going to be better, but most people just, they're, they're, they're like, if there's any chance I'll feel better out them getting yeah. them out. Yeah, I've had the same. So you talk about silicone, obviously, and adjuvant. Um, tell us about saline with the silicone, like because there's still, I think. Oh, some right. Yeah, people thought the saline implants would be safe, but actually, the the um, shell is made yeah. of silicone. And so either way, risk, whichever kind out there, it turned out to be just as risky. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. are there, um, I'm not aware of this, and you probably are way more than I do. But are there a, ways to test either? Um, that because it's almost like the immune system can pick up little pieces of silicone, right? And take it and put it into the lymphatic system. Is there any way to yeah. test for silicone in the body or, or antibodies to I it? I think that, well, there is this reactivity test yeah. that I actually have not ordered yet. I have a couple colleagues who've ordered it. We don't really know, you know, how yeah. it lines up, but like if the patient is an out-of-pocket test, so if the patient gets in, it shows and it's, I think it's silicates. And so yeah. we don't know like silicone, exactly. like, like we all need to go back to chemistry with this yeah. stuff. Right. <laughs> but, um, you know, there was one patient who had breast implants and theirs came back strongly positive. So they took that as evidence yeah. that they, yeah. a good sign that they should probably get those out. Right. But those tests have not been rigorously yes. studied, you know, like if it comes back negative, it probably doesn't you know, rule sure. out. That, exactly. You know, and, you know, the other thing is, is that, so the immune mediated against the silicone is one hypothesis or one mechanism that probably is true how it, how it develops. But the other leading one in, that's probably less common, but still pretty common is a biofilm forms around the implant made of bacteria and mold and whatnot. And the immune system reacts to that. And um, the foreign body so reaction. Yeah, and maybe the infection itself is contributing to the illness as well, mm -hmm. either or, yeah. you know, and it's probably a heterogeneous group of patients. And then there's a smaller group of patients who actually has an allergic reaction to some component. There's a lot of chemicals and heavy yeah. metals and stuff in breast implants too. That That's another thing that FDA mandated is the patient has to be given a card with the list of all of the comp, the, the entire components that are included in that implant. And it's like, Ooh, yeah. Once you read, it's kind of like dental stuff too. We, there's so many different, that's things. true. Or that's even that's actually stuff, true. like all these things, right. Yeah. Which is actually Any foreign body. Yeah. I'll say, cause I know, I'm sure you see this too. If we're talking breast implant because it's such a big deal and women need to know about this. And if they're suffering to at least think, could that be a possibility? But the truth is like even a hip implant or a um, exactly. dental implant or anything foreign in our body could be similar yeah. in triggering an immune response. Yeah. People get like cheek implants, butt yeah. implant, yeah. you know, that are also made of silicone and chin implants. And, and those are penile implant. Those are, those are all same. Right. Similar. So say a woman okay. comes in and they've had breast implants for 10, 15 years, and they have some autoimmune markers and stuff where, what kind of discussion do you have with them about, could this be a possibility and how do you navigate helping them decide what to do about it? Um, is there kind of a, take us through like a person who might come in and say, I think some of the symptoms are related. Um, and what would, yeah. um, yeah, guide you in guiding them. Well, to I always recommend they get the implants yeah. out. Yeah. because there's a really good chance that that's a, that's a, a player in the right. illness. And, you know, you can't guarantee that it's, it's going to help. But like I said, I have only one person in my practice that comes to mind who has not had hers out. And she is that exact person that you're talking about. Um, you know, I think she ha actually has an antiphospholipid antibody and symptoms and, you know, triggers trump drugs, 
If you've got something that's in your body that's driving the process and you try to treat it, the treatment doesn't usually yeah, work exactly. that well. Exactly. It's like mold, um, like any mold related illness. If someone's in a house, exactly. and mold, they get will out of the house. Get, <laughs> exactly. It, it, yeah, exact same concept. And so, um, yeah, the vat, I always recommend it. Okay. There's okay. never a reason that I would not recommend it because, and you know, there's um, some people are very talented at doing reconstruction. I have on the a slide of, um, I don't know how to show it on here, but I have a slide of a reconstruction by Dr. Eva Nagy in Australia, who's a colleague on a physician listserv who is interested, is an oncoplastic breast surgeon interested in breast implant illness and her reconstruct autologous reconstruction after explantation looks like the person has implants like a b cup you know yeah yeah Amazing. and um yeah and so pe people who you know some people i had one patient who's like god you know and the patients always feel really guilty that they got the breast implants yeah. it's my fault i got this yeah. illness no 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 i love that you say that because there's no shame around it at all <laughs> i know someone almost talked me into getting them about 15 years ago <laughs> like i almost went down that road myself you know like it and, and it's it's just tempting you know and so this one patient you know had just a kind of misshapen chest like um mis misshapen sternum and just and whatnot and and she still just felt really bad that she, she had the implants and it's, you know, and now people, you know, hopefully there'll be more, I don't know what, what the skill set of the surgeon, other surgeons besides Dr. Nagy is and being able to use autologous fat, mm -hmm. that autologous being the patient's own fat mm -hmm. and certain flaps that they do and lifts that are, are not using any foreign substances to create a decent outcome, you know what I mean? That makes the person not completely flat right. chest. They feel like, um, I mean, there are the, because those are the people, I mean, probably most of the people, I don't know. I don't know what percent of people are, are going, you know, going for the huge look versus just don't want to be super okay, flat chest. Exactly, exactly. I have no idea, but at least those um, techniques exist and are probably emerging to yeah. be able to give people and, and I'm sure they're going to emerge really fast now that the implant business is going to yes. <laughs> exactly. it has to be immediately bottoming out with that FDA ruling. I remember hearing that, but I did not uh, read the whole part about the. Um, yeah, implant. it's a really like it's they've actually literally restricted the sale mm -hmm. to surgeons who have signed mm -hmm. the agreement that they will go through that document. Now, whether that's happening yeah. or not, I don't know, <laughs> right. but they're, they could be held liable if they didn't do it, yeah. you know, because that's what the agreement that they were sold the implants under yeah. that Got it. Um, premise that would occur. So let's talk just a little bit about how this presents. We've talked about mast cell and dysautonomia, and you and I know well what this looks like. For, for someone out there who's like, what does that look like? Might I have that? Because it's so common. And I also want to mention, you just said, was it 2018, the first paper came out for mast cell activation? Because we've kind of known. Oh, no, the first case report was 2007. Okay, so and decades. The, then the first, pub, the two publications about how we should diagnose it came from one group in 2010 yeah. and another group in 2011. And th those two groups are still. Yep, I've seen them. <laughs> so totally. Yeah, group one uh, and group two. Yeah, yeah. and it <laughs> group two. I know exactly. And it sounds like you've uh, Lawrence Afrin and Theo Theoretes and some of the leaders. Have you done yeah. some? You published some work in the mass. Yeah, cell? yeah, yeah. Um, we'll be sure and link. Yeah, I, I was the co-author on the global consensus two criteria. Okay, I Dr. thought so. <laughs> Dr. Afrin was the first yeah. author. Mm -hmm. um, and he's really the leader of the consensus two group. Dr. Theo, Theo Herides is kind of a straddler to be yep, honest. Yep. So we'll link yeah. if you're listening, we will link that article here so that you can, if Good. you want more, if you want yeah, to. Yeah, I love that article. I give it to all my patients because it goes through the politics of yeah. where MCAS stands in the medical community yes. today and the difference between the consensus one and the consensus two criteria and what we as the consensus two people feel are the problems with the consensus one criteria, which are really capturing the tip of the iceberg of patients with mast cell. They don't embrace the link with POTS. They don't yep. embrace the link with Ehlers-Danlos. It's just like, really? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so I'll link that up because I, I agree it's one of my favorite papers and I thought you were an author yeah. on that. So yeah, for bringing that to the world. There's a lot of authors on there for yeah. a reason. You know, <laughs> I know you guys have worked so hard. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So let's describe for the listeners, like I think that I've heard about this. What What is mass cell activation? Give us just a little overview of that and like how it links to well, dysautonomia. Well, let me first explain that there's two arms of the immune system. So there's the what we call the innate immune system, which is the first responders where the mast cells reside and a few other cells. And they're very nonspecific in how they respond, but they're very quick to the scene. And the mast cells are the first responders. And then there's the sophisticated or um, acquired arm of the immune system where the lymphocytes reside. And the lymphocytes are the cells that take their time. They get, they get triggered or stimulated by the innate immune system to recognize, and they're making very specific antibody against the specific pathogen or virus bacteria. Um, and, and if there is a mistake in that um, antibody, or not necessarily even a mistake, but the, the antibody happens to not only recognize that pathogen, but also recognize something in your own body, um, which we call molecular mimicry, then that is actually an autoimmune disease. And so actually most autoimmune diseases are diagnosed by autoantibodies like lupus, you have an ANA, you have a double-stranded DNA, et cetera. A lot of um, even doctors call everything in this arena autoimmune, but really these disorders over here of the innate immune system of which mast cell activation syndrome is one are, we really call them auto-inflammatory. And that's where Asia autoimmune and auto-inflammatory syndromes induced by adjuvants. And the people with breast implant illness, honestly, they usually have both issues. Um, so mast cell, the mast cells are the most primitive cell of the immune system. And they've actually been around for 500 million years in multi, multicellular organisms, which just kind of blows my mind. But they, um, they are hardwired to recognize um, foreign invaders like bacteria and viruses. They align themselves or they're present in the highest numbers in the parts of the body that interface with the environment where they have the best chance of finding a foreign invader because they are, they're like sentinels. They're the first responders. So they're present in the nasal respiratory tract, the GI tract, the skin, and the genital urinary tract in the highest numbers, but they're present throughout the body. And they also love the nerves. They use nerves as a highway to communicate to the rest of the body we're under attack. So we, we see a lot of neuropsychiatric issues in mast cell. But um, the kind of hallmark symptoms, which are not present in every patient, but would you know clue most people in to start thinking about mast cells would be things like hives, environmental allergies, anaphylaxis, asthma, you know, those, those eczema. Um, those kind of conditions and flushing. And those are what are included in the consensus one criteria mostly. But then really it is a multi-system disorder because literally there are mast cells throughout the body. So we see a tremendous number, as I already said, of neuropsychiatric issues, most commonly anxiety and depression. And I see people, women come in and they're like, I had anxiety from as long as I can remember, like three, two, one, you know, I hear that all the time. They, they have insomnia, they have depression, they have ADHD, ADD, autism spectrum. I'm seeing all kinds of people and autism spectrum has been linked actually with mastocytosis too, 13 fold increased risk, which is fascinating. Yes. PTSD, OCD, ODD, all those Ds, even um, bipolar disorder. A lot of everybody who's ever walked through my door with bipolar disorder, usually it's kind of poorly characterized. They, they always have mast cell. Um, and I'm not saying everybody with those disorders has mast cell. I'm just saying everybody comes to my practice, which right. is a unique set of patients who often also have POTS and things like that. I would agree with um, you. So just so yeah. Me. Yeah. So then we see a, a, not any number of GI. Oh, and then POTS, you know, not just psychiatric, but neuro too. So POTS is being number one, like autonomic nervous system disorder and, and other autonomic disorders very, very common link with um, mast cell activation. And it was published, I think it was the last year, maybe the year before now, the link with um, mast cell activation and small fiber neuropathy. And the autonomic nerves are a type of small fiber nerve. So there's a really strong link there. Um, and I, I, I don't like to, I, I just use this phrase very loosely, but I think mast cell is the most common cause of POTS. I use the causation loosely because causation is very hard to prove, but just like, if you see enough patients, yeah, 
you, you know, absolutely. You, you know, without meeting the consensus one people's in insurmountable level of right. proof that they demand. <laughs> they fit. Yeah. Um, but you, if you're a doctor in the trenches, seeing a lot of patients, yep. So and that's good because mast cell is very treatable with simple drugs often, and sometimes not even drugs, just removing yeah. the triggers, like changing the diet and mm-hmm. getting rid of the fillers and medications and things like that. So um, what else? Like bladder trouble, like, you know, urine urinary infection symptoms without, without an infection, or some people are diagnosed with interstitial cystitis, yes. headaches um, seizure like episodes, um, any kind of skin manifestation, frequent nasorespiratory issues like recurrent sinusitis, chronic nasal congestion, you know, all of these things that can just, it's this huge number of symptoms that patients can develop. And everybody with mast cell activation has their own unique case. So everybody has a different combination of uh, those problems and um, they respond to different medications and the way in which their illness manifests and, and might flare looks different from person to person. So that's part of the challenge of mast cell activation, even though it's very treatable, the patient really has to take ownership and try to figure out, they have to put on their detective cap and try to figure out all this stuff. Figures. I'm an educator and you're an educator yeah. and then the patient has to go. That's and- the primary, right? For them to start to connect with it. So let's talk that way because we clearly know breast implants are a huge piece of this puzzle in women, but there's so many other things that can be triggers. What are some of the common, you mentioned fillers and medications, different foods. Um, I'm assuming oh, for mast cell. Yeah. Like let's go through kind of the categories. Yeah. I mean, so many different things. What are some of the common, well, the, all the, well, mold, as you yes. know, is a major trigger. So, um, but all of the chemicals in our environment, which include personal care and cleaning products. So I always just, that's low hanging fruit. It's like, get rid of the plastics, get rid of the coated pans, use the cleaner, you know, seventh generation yeah. free and clear instead of Tide and Cascade. And, and no plugins, you know. please. <laughs> right. The plug-in Yeah. And different people, you know, so, most people, if you say, if you, most people with mast cell activation syndrome, another piece of it, another clue to it is they're sensitive to chemicals. Yep. So if you say, did deter- any detergents ever bother your skin or sunscreen or toothpaste or any scented products, probably 90, maybe 95% will say yes. And so there is a small subset of people where those things don't seem to bother them, but I'm still like, just at least get rid of the plastics and at least get rid, you know, just do the simple things. Right. And then there are other people who are so sensitive, they have to go, Mm -hmm. make their own shampoo and things like that. They they figure that out themselves. Um, So then um, all the chemicals in the food, quote unquote food. (laughs) So diet, diet's huge. Some people can just eat a change to, uh, you know, non-processed anti-inflammatory diet. And, and oftentimes they, you know, that includes going gluten-free and or dairy-free and, seeing what effect high histamine foods have some people, all of those things just matter tremendously. And that's all they have to do. Yeah. It's funny because 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, I had the Crohn's and the breast cancer and all that. And I atopic allergies, asthma, uh, eczema, like the whole atopic thing. So I exactly. had all the mast cell stuff. And I didn't have any idea about like histamine and foods, but all the things that were high histamine, fermented cheeses and aged meats and cheeses and smoked salmon and um, bone broths and uh, uh, kombucha. And, kombucha. Right? Oh, yeah. And all those things bothered me. So I kind of really just healthy realized. Foods. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, really yeah, exactly. The good, like all the fermented products and things. People are like, "What's?" So years ago, I didn't even know that connection to histamine. But I was like, "Why these foods are all bothering me?" I took them out. And later, I was like, "Oh, it's the whole list of histamine foods, right?" Of course. Yeah. Well, you know, your case is interesting because um, Crohn's is an autoinflammatory yeah. syndrome. You see the link with all these other, you yeah. know, spondyloarthropathy inflammatory bowel disease are all over yeah. here. They, they overlap a lot with uh, mast cell and other things like endometrial, you know, I, yes. and you just feel like the root problem is in the mast cells. Yes. yes. And there's a higher risk of cancer in mm-hmm. mast cell too. There's all these yeah. growth dystrophisms because the mast cells regulate tissue growth. And so if I were to put your case together, I would think your root problem was mast cell. 
I agree. Have I you come to that conclusion? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. It's it yeah. And then you got the mold exposure. Yeah, throw, exactly. Throw all that on there. So let's go. Uh, obviously there's some great treatments and stuff. We don't have to go through all that, but what I really want to talk about is IVIG. You're someone who has used that very successfully. I have seen the same. Tell us about, first of all, what is it for those listening? And then also just like, why might that be a treatment for some of the complex cases and where have you found it to be most useful? Yeah. Uh, well, so first it's basically um, immunoglobulin, which is the antibody part of our blood, the liquid part of our blood. So it's, it's derived from blood donors. You can actually be a plasma donor. I, I understand they pay quite a lot of money. I don't know how much, but so, and they actually, when they make a batch of IVIG, it's pulled from I think something like six to 10,000 donors. Yeah. And the reason for that is that the original use for IVIG, which has been around more than 30 years, maybe 40 years now, was for patients who had immune deficiency. They had low antibody levels and they're getting recurrent infections. So it makes sense that you would use this pooled antibodies from all these people who've been exposed to different infection and had antibodies together to most of the things you would want to cover. So, and then, um, and, and actually doesn't make any sense really intuitively that you would use it for autoimmune disease. You've already got too much immunity. So why would you give more? And it wasn't really anybody's idea. It was just fortuitously found that in, there were some kids, there was one boy who had um, immune deficiency, or sorry, he had, uh, yeah, he had immune deficiency and he also had ITP, which is autoimmune destruction of the platelets. So they noticed when they gave this kid his IVIG for his immune deficiency that his platelet count would go up. And so then they got a couple other kids and, and that was how they figured it out. And there's, there's about 10 different proposed hypotheses for the way in which IVIG might work for autoimmune diseases, which are ex extremely complex immunology, but um, uh, it works. It honestly works. You can find a paper showing it works for pretty much any autoimmune disease. Um, not auto-inflammatory, but autoimmune. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so the patients where I use it is a very small subset of the patients that I see. It's um, patients with um, refractory dysautonomia, usually POTS, who first, I always, even if I know they have antibodies, even if they have 10 antibodies, I still treat their POTS with the typical POTS treatments, you know, the, my, what I call the Band-Aid treatments, like salt yep. and vasoconstrictors and beta blockers and, and volume expansion, Florina. Um, and then I treat what almost always is present is mast cell. Yeah. Because I don't think I have anybody in my practice with autoimmune dysautonomy who doesn't have at least some degree of mast cell. And oftentimes they have a lot of mast cell. So some people, they get better just by treating their POTS and their mast cell, even though they have the antibodies. But the people who don't, you know, you're missing that piece. So that's a sub small subset of my practice that I treat with IVIG. And when I put together my data some years ago, I don't remember 2018, I think I published this data because I've been treating, doing this for years already. Um, it was 80, almost 85% of those patients respond and they respond dramatically. Like their functional ability increases yeah. by 50%, which is a lot. Like if a hundred percent is normal and 0% is dead and 30% is bed bound, they increased by an average of 50, 52% is really the people who respond, respond dramatically. Like it's a game changer yeah. drug. So, um, and for some reason, 15% of the people don't respond. I have seen this. I guess that's true with everything in medicine, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. But I couldn't agree more. I'm such a fan for those really tough cases. Um, two questions. Are you using the higher, like autoimmune two grams per kilo dose? typically on those patients? Oh, no, I start with one. I, I have a published protocol in POTS because POTS patients don't tend to tolerate IVIG as well. Like if you give it to the kids with people with yes. ITP, they, they could tolerate it fine. Got it. Uh, most of the neurologists, they're used to giving two grams per yeah. kilogram per month dose because they're treating patients with myasthenia gravis or Guillain-Barre on a ventilator. So they just want to slam yeah. them. But if you give a POTS patient that dose, you will give them like such severe aseptic meningitis that will never oh, yeah. take that drug yeah. again. I mean, 
Because yeah, the mast cells will react yeah. initially when you give it, right? So you're actually like typically- Yeah, they, they get like really, mm -hmm. yeah. So I start with one gram per kilogram mm -hmm. per month, which so mm -hmm. that uh, the autoimmune, so there's, you referring to high dose. So yeah. low dose is what we call um, for the immune deficiency patients, the, those original yeah. patients with the low antibodies. And then high doses for autoimmune disease, which ranges from one gram per kilogram per month to two grams per kilogram per month. And so since these patients don't tolerate it well, and I personally think the reason they don't tolerate it well is they, they all have some degree of mast cell activation and IVIG seems to activate mast cells. Exactly. So um, I start with one gram per kilogram per month and I also divide that dose weekly. Yep. I divide it the monthly dose weekly. So they get a quarter of a gram yep. per kilogram weekly. And then I, and then I just try to get them eventually to get the whole dose once a month, one gram per kilogram once a month. And not everybody gets to that. And then I'll notch people. I, if people don't get to 80 to hundred, I try, I'll go, let's go to go up to 1.15 gram per kilogram, 1.3. I would say the average dose that people settle out on, you know, you always want to get the lowest, most effective dose because it's a burdensome drug. Yeah. So long infusion, it, you know, the Cost, higher the dose, that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> effect, extremely costly, um, is 1.3 grams per kilogram okay. per mm -hmm. month. So the neurologists start at two and they go down and I started and one. Start, I, love, I love that. This is, I'm treating a chronic condition. So I'm in the marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. They're, they're used to the sprint and they don't recognize this is different or they don't maybe right. maybe they recognize it but they're just used to giving that and i think they don't recognize that the pots patients are different and how they tolerate it they just don't tolerate it and if you're on a ventilator anyway nobody's going to have any side exactly. effects <laughs> no and and like you so, i treat these patients too and work with the ivig so it's very i see all of this the real reactive so you have a published mm -hmm. protocol we will link that to yeah I'd love to link those up for people who want to. Know oh yeah, that. I can send that to you. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, uh, amazing. For use, in, for, yeah. for use in dysautonomia. Yeah. So in our last few minutes, the only other thing I really want to cover is we've talked about the the breast implant illness, how it connects to POTS and mast cell and autoimmunity, and why women probably should have them explanted if possible. Um, mm -hmm. What about say the woman who's had the explant surgery, and you mentioned what I see too. There's some percentage, and I'd love to know what you see in clinic that get better and they get better pretty quickly. And then there's a lot of women that struggle and they kind of need the detoxes up, what would you do after explant surgery to kind of help that woman regain her? Well, I, I guess I, I treat them the same as all yeah. the other people. Like I treat, I see if, if they have pots, I treat yeah. their pots. Got it. If they have mast cell, I treat their mast cell. If they don't get better by treating pots and mast cell, then if they have autoimmunity, I would offer them IVIG. Or if, if they... I don't usually use IVIG unless people are really sick. And by, I define that by inability to go to work or school um, because it's just too burdensome to like, if, if somebody's got a functional ability of like 70%, like it doesn't make sense to spend, you know, 200,000 a year and to have them hooked up to an IV yeah. you know, all day. And the drug itself can cause side effects and, you know, everything else. So um, so pla I also use hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil in the people with autoantibodies who aren't as sick enough to justify IVIG. Um, and yeah, and, and the, these, you know, there's no studies yet in this context, but it just, this is just all an emerging area, you know, mm, tremendous. so well, yeah, we're all learning. We are, aren't we? And we have to kind of be on those front lines because there's so many patients who need people like you who are looking at this and looking deeper. And um, well, you have just given us such a gift with your knowledge already. And thank you for being on the forefront in these tough cases and also publishing because we need the data yes. so that our physicians, right? Can do. Um, uh, yeah. where can people find out more about you, find your papers, find your work. Oh, uh, well, I have all my papers on my website, which is www.centerformultisystemdisease.com. I, I, I have all of my papers. Perfect. Uh, so we will public. link to that so that you have anyone who yes. download those. Yeah. So then I, I won't send you that. The, that Perfect. includes the yeah. um, global consensus to criteria for MCAS paper is on there. Um, that can really, really helpful to get kind of a starting point with MCAS and the, the politics. Cause a lot of, a lot of patients get 
told, oh, you can't have MCAS because your trip taste is normal. And if you read that paper, you all kind of understand that yeah. that's not. Mm. Yeah, thanks for bringing hope and healing to so many. Thanks for the work that you continue to do. And thanks again for today, for your time, your effort, all of your incredible wisdom. It's so great to connect. And I just want yes, to say, simply, I, I admire and appreciate yeah, all that you are doing <laughs> for these patients. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. Okay.